Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and usually twice a month. This month we are bringing a special treat. We have Jonathan Gray, the remarkable website, B for Us, B E F O R E U S dot com. And the most important book we've done in years is The Forbidden Secret. We're up to chapter 24. The title of the chapter and what topics we're going to cover today, Jonathan, are. Was his, the rescuer's name, was his name foretold? Right. Now, one of the things that I was shown at eight and a half when I had my dear death experience and had a tonsil artery slashed and literally face to face met the Most High God was that I was told that the past, present, and future to God are now. There's no such thing as time to God. God doesn't have to wait to see what events are. He knows the past, present, and the future for infinity. There is if present. He lives in the eternal now. God is omniscient. He even knows those who will decide to actually be with him forever and those who aren't. And it doesn't violate our free will. But he is a totally omniscient about it. And that's what's so important that people understand that he, when he laid these things out, he gave people adequate choice and adequate information, including the signs and the stars. And even this rabbi recently has been revealed that he knew the name of the Messiah was going to be Yeshua. I think he died at like 108. That uh, was his age. And he wrote down Yeshua, which means Yahweh, the, the breath, which means the Father in the flesh. Very significant. Yes, well, uh, the name was given from the very beginning, and, and when you talk about um, there being no past, present, or future, it's, it's all present with him. That's very yeah. true. Right. And so yeah. only he was able to identify who he was sending, and uh, and this name was put right there in the very beginning, given early in Earth's history, long before uh, Yeshua came to Earth. It was written in the scriptures, it was written in the stars, and it was known to quite a few nations, not just the Hebrews. Right, and, and this moment where we're witnessing, today. this witness that we're giving today on the airways, as it says, they'll rain down the word uh, of the truth of, of, from the heavens, which is coming down by radio all over the planet. That raining down was prophesied. God saw this moment of this witness of his name before he created the universe. Isn't that exciting that we can all be part of something that he's already known? Right. Well, Dr. Bill, um, going to the New Testament, of course, uh, we find that when uh, the angel, the heavenly messenger, came to visit that man, Joseph, concerning the coming birth of a child, he said, uh, Thou shalt call his name Yeshua which is actually salvation. He should call his name salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. And, and this word Yeshua, or Yahushua, means the Lord saves. It's a combination of Yahweh, the Eternal One, and the Hebrew root Yesha, which means to be delivered or to a position of freedom or safety. So hence the word salvation. It sums it up very well. Yeah, that's a really good term, isn't it? It also it explains a lot of the dogma that's been observed by the church is incorrect. Uh, one of the areas, and I, I want to deal with this so people don't understand at least some of the things that I think the, that the truth is, that the way you look at God is God cannot be contained just in one individual, in the totality of an individual, but he can be expressed in it. So Jesus was the totality of God, so is the Holy Spirit, and so is the Father God. And they're not three separate persons. This idea of three separate personhood is a Masonic tradition that was passed on to the church in the third century. Trinitarianism isn't based in reality. Jesus Christ was the fullness of God. He said when, they, when Jesus said in his pre-incarnate self, let there be light, let there be the universe. It was Jesus that created it. Yes, it was He. He wasn't and a separate person. It wasn't the Father. In the New Testament, people just don't bother to read it. Right. Yeah, the thing is that uh, some of these other dogmas were, were purposely put there so that it would allow Masonic infiltration into the church, which occurred in the third century during the times of, of Constantine. And, of course, all of the times, all of the uh, apostasy that's entered the church over the years, many of it was passed on to the Protestant churches and continues to this day. The fact is that Jesus is the Father in the flesh. That's what the name means. Yahashua means the breath that created all it was, incarnate in flesh. Yes. Um, I, I, I like to tell the story, which I, with your permission I'll tell this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, about a Jewish man who spoke to a Jewish scholar on the name of, of Yeshua. Yes. Uh, Arthur Glass was a Jew who was convinced that Yeshua was the promised Messiah. He lived in the United States, actually, in St. Louis. And he met a fellow Jew in the home of a mutual friend. And the conversation gravitated to the subject of Yeshua, Jesus. 
And the other Jewish man flung at Arthur this challenge. He said, if Yeshua is our Messiah and the whole Tanakh, that's the Old Testament, is about him, how come his name is never mentioned in it even once? Well, it is, responded Arthur. Oh, rubbish, look, I'm a Hebrew scholar. I tell you, you can't find the name of Yeshua in the Old Testament. So the other Jew, uh, who believed, paused for an instant, then he bent down, opened his briefcase, and took out his Hebrew Bible. And he turned to Isaiah 62:11, and he said, My friend, would you translate into English this Hebrew passage for me? And the Jewish scholar did so quite easily. He translated it quickly, rapidly, accurately. And his translation of the text was this. Behold, Yahweh has proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy Yeshua cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Well, immediately he, he turned red, his face turned red. It, he realized what he had said. And he screamed out, No, no, you made me read thy Yeshua, Mr. Glass. You tricked me. Well, the reply was, No, I didn't trick you. I just had you read the word of God for yourself. Can't you see that here, salvation is a person? It's not a thing, not an event. He comes. His reward is with him. His work before him. Right. Yeah, and, the reason and the why old man it, it rushed is a, to open his own Old yeah. Testament, and he was talking frantically while he did that. He said, look, I'm sure mine is different from yours. You, you have tricked me. Well, yeah. he found the passage, he looked it over, and he dropped like a deflated balloon. Right. His Hebrew Bible was, of course, identical, and it's right there in the Tanakh. Well, the reason is because typically the Jews think there's 613 or so rules that you have to follow in order to be a, a, acceptable to God, when in actual, all you need to do is accept the uh, the unqualified sacrifice of Yeshua HaMashiach, and then, and then, and since your blood, your life then becomes joined to his, and your, your sins are forgiven, it's just instantly, you don't have to do anything. Your doing occurs after a relationship is now established. And the establishment of the relationship doesn't earn you more points. God doesn't grade on the, on the curve. He simply says, all you do is accept me, accept my lordship of your life, and it's over. It's done. Uh, he takes your sins as far as the east is from the west, whether you were an abortionist, a murderer, a rapist, a, 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 a thief, whatever. It doesn't matter what sins you did, that God can separate those things. A lot of it is done in ignorance. A lot of people have done evil in ignorance because they thought it was the quote, right thing to do. But God can take those things and cast them away, and you don't have to do anything. And the hardest thing, I think, for people is to forgive themselves when they know God has already forgiven them and cast their sins away. And that's why the only way salvation could come is as a person, because it was based on the grading on the curve. No one would be good enough for God. Yes. And you know, uh, Dr. Bill, in the Hebrew Scriptures, the expected Messiah is referred to as Yeshua, uh, Yeshua is found about 100 times in the plain surface text all the way from Genesis through to Habakkuk. Right. Uh, the very word, the very name that the angel Gabriel later used when he told Mary about the son she was supposed to have. Right. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting that um, anyone who impartially reads the, the Hebrew Old Testament will find the name of Jesus right there, the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua, all the way through. Yeah, amazing. And, and it's found, actually, very often in a way that it cannot refer to a, to a, a principle or a thought. It, it has to refer to a person. And um, as a matter of fact, I found in the Jewish prayer book, um, let me read this. I have it in front of me here. A prayer book for the year translated by uh, Dr. Uh, A. T. Phillips, page 100. And this is published by the Hebrew Publishing Company in the Jewish prayer book. May it be thy will that the sounds of the chauffeur at the ram's horn, which we have sounded today, be woven into thy tapestry. Yeshua, the prince of thy presence and prince of might. Wow. Amazing. So there he's called the, the Prince of God himself. Back in a moment with Jonathan Gray. Welcome back. 
welcome back, and uh, we were reading through The Forbidden Secret by Jonathan Gray. You can obtain this ebook anywhere in the world by going to beforeus.com, and I call it re- required reading. I'll be releasing uh, my updated uh, version of Clay and Iron and Abortion to Armageddon this fall, along with my uh, what I call Quantum Wellness book, medical book, that will be coming out this fall. And what's really important people understand is that you have to have both intellectual sharpness God wants you to use your brain just like we use discernment over these intelligence releases that John Moore talked about the last few weeks and I said I have no corroboration for that I went off and prayed and you have two witnesses you have the witness of your intellect which you need to be sharp, you need to read the scriptures you need to check your intelligence reports and whatever read the newspaper, get as much source as you can but then you need to go pray and you have those two witnesses, your spirit, which is led by the Most High God that will not allow you to be lied to if you truly seek the truth. And I had no confirmation. And I stated this repeatedly, and I wanted to state it again so people understand. But we are moving. When we have this kind of information being looped through multiple sources, it means the government, and I mean the government, through the military, is doing a major psyop against the population and alternative media because they're getting ready for really big things, not right now, August, September, but soon really soon and they're getting things in place just like they had a war game in Japan uh, last two weeks for the evacuation of Tokyo within four years but really it could happen any day because of Fukushima or a major superquake there anywhere in northern Japan our material our logistics are now in place for evacuation now 45 million people the largest metropolitan area on the earth so when we look at these scriptures you need to understand these things in order to be spiritually prepared because even if you're physically prepared you will be paralyzed if you don't know that even though you're in the fire like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego the fourth man, Yeshua HaMashiach the father in the flesh who is standing there in the fire with those three ancient Hebrews is with us now yeah if you don't know that you're going to freak out you're going to go, my God, oh God, we're not going to make it no, you're not going to make it if you don't have God with you. You can have all the bullets and food. And I remember telling this to a man back in uh, Nebraska. I traveled to 42 cities in Israel in 1999 with a pro- prophecy club. And I said, he said, we got a berm shelter. We got anti-aircraft guns. We got all kinds of stuff. I said, really? I said, can you deal with a Predator drone firing a missile over the horizon at 17,000 miles an hour coming in with a you know, 100 kiloton nuclear weapon with a penetrator that can go down a half mile into the ground? he looked at me and his eyes got real big and I said nope I said well if you're the most high God tells you not to go toward your berm shelter and your food storage but to go in another direction you better listen to the spirit and that's why I tell people you got to study to be approved you got to read the Bible you got to look at these books like you've written because you're opening the seals just like Daniel to give people a perspective of where are we we're really close to some really crazy times and I'm not setting dates but when you start to look assembling the pieces you say Ooh, this doesn't look like it's decades away. This looks like it's years or months. This doesn't look like it's a long way away without setting times, but ooh, this is looking really, really bad. And it is. We're not trying to scare people. We want them to be prepared spiritually, number one, physically, and also not just for themselves but their neighbor, but it should be a witnessing tool. This should be a witnessing tool to tell the neighbors when you're ready, why were you ready? He was ready because our God through the love letter of the Bible, which is also a death certificate, a warrant for arrest, and an autopsy report. It's also a love letter from God to tell us at the time of the end, I'm going to tell you what's coming so you can be ready for me, because I'm coming and it's not going to be pleasant, the things that are going to happen before I return. Yeah. And you know, we were talking about the Jewish yearbook there, Dr. Bill, and the question I'd like to ask, how do those sages who wrote the prayer book know that the name of the Messiah was Yeshua, Jesus? Well, the answer to that is that they understood what the Bible teaches concerning the Messiah. But now you're talking about his return, and on the same page of the prayer book, that's page 100, is this prayer to God. May he appear the second time, and it's talking about Yeshua the Prince. May he appear the second time. Now, why did my question is this. Why did the Hebrew sages write that? Evidently because there were some honest ones among them who knew and wrote the truth. And though most of the Jewish people are oblivious to it, they knew he had already come once. Sure they did. In fact, my ancestor was the Kohen Gadol at the time of Jesus and became a believer and follower of Jesus. And he was he was a Hebrew, a, a son of the, of the northern tribes, a Kohen. And uh, 
and he believed, like many of the most people realize, the entire early church were all Hebrews and Jews. Hebrews and Jews. And by the way, Cohens are not Jews; they're Hebrews. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah. Now here's another statement in the Jewish Sabbath and Festival prayer book, and uh, it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is our God. He is our Father. He is our King. He is our Redeemer. And in His mercy, we will hear from Him twice before right. the presence of all living beings, and He will be our God." Wow. Now. Twice is the same word Shinit, which uh, in Isaiah 11.11 11 is translated the second time. So this word can only mean two times, and clearly alludes to the fact that the Messiah comes two times. First, he comes as Messianic prophet, and he comes to, to be the suffering servant. The second time, he comes as Messianic king. And this is right through the Old Testament, the, the Tanakh. And uh, if any honest uh, Jew would like to delve further into this, I, I can give references. I give references in my book, and, and uh, certainly you can check those out, and you'll find that what I'm saying is absolutely true today. Wow, that's amazing. Really good research. Now, not only was his name on the surface, uh, but also it was encoded. Uh, we won't go into the code aspect of it, but it was coded in all the Messianic prophecies. We won't go uh, much into this, but I will mention one or two points. Uh, it's coded in virtually every major Messianic prophecy of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Now, uh, to repeat, beneath the surface, the appearances of the name Yeshua are found especially clustered around the Messianic prophecies. And... Uh, for example, in the Torah, the five books of Moses, at least 12 times Yeshua is encoded at precisely 7,000 letter intervals. Not 6,997 or 7,001, precisely 7,000 letter intervals, 12 times one after another in succession. And if anyone tells me that's an accident, then they, I don't think they, they're, they're wide awake. They've got to start thinking. Wait, because, you can use mathematics to prove that it's not uh, logical to even consider that. A, uh, a reasonable probability. That is right. Yes, and uh, in um, in Exodus chapter twelve, with verse twenty-seven, which speaks of the Passover ritual, which actually was a <clears throat> not only a symbol of a, a memorial of coming out of Egypt at the Exodus, but also a prophecy of the Lamb of God who was to come and give His life in the future. And uh, it was known among Jewish scholars that Passover would be the time they would expect him to, to perform a greater event of uh, redemption for, the, for mankind. And Exodus speaks of the Passover ritual, and starting with the last letter of the fifth word and reading right through, uh, we find the Lamb, Messiah, spelt out. And we find that the name Yeshua is spelled out at 777 letter intervals. Every 777 letters, you wow. have the name Yeshua appearing. Amazing. Let's continue with this remarkable story. Again, we're up to chapter 24 of The Forbidden Secret with Jonathan Gray, the website beforeus.com. Amazing analysis of these important events. And again, you've done many other books. Uh, you can obtain them at beforeus.com. The signs in the heavens. Uh, all these things were fully known. The ancients knew these signs. Uh, Moses knew the signs. Abraham knew the signs. That's why he received the promise. The promise of the Abrahamic, of the, the uh, literally the great Aliyah, which is yet to come. Most people don't realize the original Aliyah, which was led by Moses to the land of, of promise, wasn't the totally appropriate, which is between the the uh, river Euphrates, all the way from north to Turkey, all the way down to the Sinai Peninsula and to the Nile River, was all given to the lands to the, not just quote the Jews, but to the two houses of Israel, and the great Aliyah is yet a future time. That's very, very interesting. Now, yeah. something else relating to uh, Yeshua, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. Um, as we've noted in the past, the Hebrew and Greek languages, each letter of the alphabet also doubles as a number. 
And uh, just as in Latin, V equals 5, X equals 10, you know, C equals 100 and so on, except that each every, and every letter in the Hebrew language and also in the Greek has a numerical value. And the numerical value of each letter in a Hebrew word, that gives you the numerical value for the whole word. Now, the name Yeshua is composed of four Hebrew consonants, Yod, Shin, War, and Ayan. And uh, the total numeric value of the four letters of Yeshua is 386. And, but get this, 12 times in the Torah that name Yeshua is spelled out at 386 letters. A, 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 a word, Yeshua, which has a numeric value of 386, is spelled out at 386 letter intervals throughout the Torah. Wow. Now, we might well ask, has Yeshua placed his signature on every page of his written word? We know he's the creator. He not only created the universe, he created us. He has created the scriptures which we find and have today. And it seems that his name is not only on the surface right through, but also as a barely visible watermark on a banknote underneath the surface numerically. So without a shadow of doubt, the message of the promised Messiah was encapsulated in the total message of the Old Testament. And it's right there. No one has an excuse to say that he could not be identified. Now, among other fallacies that we have is, is that some nations did not... Uh, have any knowledge of the truth. For example, the Druids of Britain are considered to be pagans who practice human sacrifice. Archaeologically, this has now been disproven, and we won't go into that today, but the propaganda was deliberately promoted by their Roman enemies to defame a gentle people they could never conquer. Now, this may surprise most of our listeners, but in pre-Christian times, the Druid universities were the largest in the world both in size and attendance. And records from that time still survive. There were 60 large universities in Britain with an average attendance of over 60,000 students. And this fact is substantiated by both Greek and Roman testimony. And uh, we have records here that the noble and the wealthy of Rome and other nations sent their children to Britain to study law and science and religion. Isn't that amazing? That's a surprise, I think, to most people. It is, isn't it? Now, examination of the ground around the altar at Stonehenge by uh, the eminent archaeologist Sir Flinders Petrie has completely demolished the human sacrifice accusations. His discovery of only fossilized bones of sheep and goats, similar to that of the sacrificial system of the Hebrews, established an affinity with the patriarchal faith. And in each case, the sacrificial burnt offerings were the same as those stated in the biblical record. Now, the word druid, I, I have a reason for following this, as you'll soon see. The, the, the word druid, actually, is derived from uh, druthan, which means servant of truth. And the motto of the druids was, when they went into battle, the truth against the world. Now... The Druid triads emphasized the omniscience of one God, the coming of the Messiah, and ultimate eternal life. And they believed that the coming one would sacrifice his life to atone for every man's sins. They looked for him as the cure of all ills. Uh, similar, and they, they had an emblem for him, which was the mistletoe, very similar to the, the branch of Israel's prophetic uh, writings. Now, the interesting thing is this, that the Druids, simultaneously with the wise men of Persia, discovered in the sky the star of prophecy which heralded the long-expected arrival of Yeshua. But not only that, in the Celtic tri triads of these people was recorded this poem, The Lord our God is one. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Yeshua. He is the King of glory. Now, there we have it. 
It's as easy to see as, as, your, as your hand in front of your eyes. And how long ago was that? The knew the name Yeshua hundreds of years before Jesus arrived. Right. And they were waiting for him, too. By the way, the Druidic priesthood were the ones that were cast off during the Assyrians across Europe. So the Druid priesthood were the priests of uh, across the, the Welsh, the Irish, the Scottish, etc., uh, unfortunately, after they were cast off, they often absorbed a lot of the uh, pagan practices of the local people. But in fact, originally they were the uh, proper priests of the northern tribes of Israel. That is, that would be right. Yes, and and they were looking forward to the same Messiah that we know has now come. Right, but they absorbed uh, apostasy when they were cast off. You can even go to the Book of the Kells in Ireland, 2,800 years ago, at the time of of uh, the Book of Ezekiel, and you'll see it written in. Uh, it literally kept in Ireland, and there's a copy in St. Mary's University uh, in Nova Scotia, Canada, where it's actually written in ancient Aramaic. You can see the book of the ancient sticks in the castle in Edinburgh that are written in Aramaic that shows that uh, 3,000 years ago that the ancient Scots, in fact, were in fact ancient Hebrews. That's why they call it the Hebrides or the Isles of the Hebrews. It makes sense. Uh, and, yeah. and every every uh, new discovery only reinforces that. Uh, we have to conclude that uh, a lot of our history has been covered up. Sure it is. And, and I'm glad to be alive in this time when much of the lost is now coming back to light. Well, I think it's, a, it's another one of those signs from Daniel to indicate that at the time of the end, many will run to and for, flow and knowledge will greatly increase, and these things will all be unsealed. The unsealing is happening right now. Right around the world, whether it's in New Zealand or India or China, many of these shows are being translated into other languages. People are making YouTube clips. They're starting to understand that there's a convergence of scientific, astrological, uh, geopolitical, and spiritual that is all occurring to tell us we're at the end of an age or at the dawn of another age. It's going to be completely different. Yes. What an exciting time to be alive. Yes, it really is. Uh, please continue. Yes. Now, um, so it's easy to see. The Druids originally knew the name Yeshu, Jesus, hundreds of years before Christ. And this name was incorporated in their religion. And in Britain, the name Jesus was always the pure Celtic Yeshu. It never changed. Now, Druidism's influence on the ancient world, as well as its peaceful and ready reception of the Christian faith proves that it had a noble base originally and Druidism right. prepared the way for Christianity in Britain and when Joseph of Arimathea was exiled uh, he en ended up in Britain because he knew that he would, be, he would be safe from Roman and Jewish persecution over there they had been unconquered, they remained unconquered and the Romans never ever got more than just a few miles in from the sea when they tried to conquer Britain. They were always driven back. Right. This shows not only the fact that, um, that they had a, a great culture, but they had a, a very um, a well organized military for their own protection. And uh, they upheld the world against the truth. In other words, they said the truth against the world. That was their motto when they went into battle and they actually had it on their flag as they went for Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And of course, this is also explains the reason why so many of the Celtic peoples were more than willing to fight for the Holy Land. Uh, during the Crusades is because of their ancient tie to the Holy Land. Uh, they were, in fact, living in the northern lands of Israel and were cast off by the Assyrians around uh, 28, 2900 years ago uh, to the areas of Ireland, Scotland, and these areas of Germany, etc., and Britain, uh, long before the Romans and these other uh, civilizations even rose to power. Uh, you made an interesting point about the Hebrides being derived from the Hebrew, and, and that is, that's absolutely true, yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned about the, the, the words later, apostasy, but that came many centuries later. Uh, but in fact, a lot of these things were spread because uh, the, the great military power of the northern tribes, it's the reason why I could refer to America and to uh, not only Britain and America as Ephraim America, because in fact the tribes of Ephraim have populated America, Australia, Canada, and all these countries are in fact the lands of the modern, in this century, uh, the descendants of the Hebrews, the northern tribes of Israel. Very, very interesting. And we've forgotten our origins. 
Yeah, very important too. Uh, very yeah. important because people should understand it also has a tie with the the working order of the end times. Why? Who, why is when I put my foot down on this on the land in 1992? At Ben Gurion Airport in Israel, I put my foot down and I heard a, a loud voice in the spirit that said, "You are standing on American soil. This is America. The 51st state, Israel, is America. That's why it should not ever be divided. And in fact, God's eventual plan is for the lands of the Abrahamic lands to be given not just to the the Jews that many of them returned in apostasy to the state of Israel, which was raised as a communist state, with Joe Slovo from the Communist Party of Russia, etc., uh, after they had the Balfour Declaration. But the real issue is God wants believers to return to the land in a great aliyah in the future, hundreds of millions of them from all over the world. They're not just Jews, but are believers from a devastated world. Well, we're, we're living closer to the final events. Each moment we're drawing closer. Yes. Now, continuing the the knowledge of Yeshua's name, uh, just just to re retrack a moment, it was in the uh, surface message of the Torah, the Old Testament. It was in the uh, under surface message, the, below the surface, uh, like a watermark. It was uh, also known to people like the Druids of the British Isles. And it was known to people like the Persians, the Egyptians, and others as well, the name Yeshua as, as the name of the coming Messiah that the whole world was expecting. Now, getting into the star maps, this is not about astrology, Bill. It's the archaeology of the ancient star maps. And just as all nations once shared a common knowledge, a common language, rather, likewise all nations had an original zodiac derived from a common source. Now, very early in human history, the stars were named and arranged into groups, which we call constellations. They were drawn on sky charts as hieroglyphics, or pictures of animals, people, and so on. And significantly, the same names were consistent throughout all of history and throughout all the cultures of the world, and they've survived even onto our astronomical charts today. And these constellations extend in a belt about 16 degrees wide in the sky, encircling the Earth. Now, just suppose we could go out right now and look up into the sky and see the stars in daytime. The sun would appear to move through this belt in the course of a year in a path we call the ecliptic. And it's this belt with 12 months for its steps or stages that we call the zodiac. Now, the word zodiac actually comes from an ancient Hebrew word meaning a way by steps, representing the 12 steps of the year. And each stage of the yearly cycle contains its own group of stars, which are designated by a picture or a sign. And these are the 12 signs of the zodiac. But each of the 12 is accompanied by three adjacent signs, which we call decans or pieces, which explain the main sign. And so this gives us a well-ordered set of not just 12 signs, but 48, 12 groups of four. Now, someone's going to say, but there's more constellations than that. That's true. There are 88 constellations in all, but only 48 lie within the band across the sky that we call the zodiac. And that's where the message is written. Now, uh, there's evidence that the most ancient peoples uniformly acknowledge these pictures and names as sacred in meaning, a coordinated system which told the story of the coming Messiah. Now, one of the greatest astronomers of all times and historians was, uh, that we've ever seen in the world was Albemeza. And he was astronomer for the Carlos of Granada. And speaking of these constellations, he actually records that none of these forms from their first invention have varied in coming down to us. Not one of their names changed. Not a point added or removed. Now, his uh, his uh, record is in the British Museum Library. And the star maps of his day, he lived about 850 AD. We still use the star maps of his day, and they've basically never been altered since their origin thousands of years ago. He testifies to that, and he did his research very well. They're essentially the same today as they were in the beginning. And they recorded a prophecy. And when you translate the constellation and star names into English you get meanings such as the serpent of Eve, 
the coming lamb to be slain, the enemy of the coming, the sacrifice slain, bruised in the heel, who comes to save, the pierced, the slain, the coming judge, this one comes to reign, the serpent bruiser, rejoicing over the serpent, the punished deceiver, Satan's head, and so on. Now, from that list, you can get an idea that why would you name stars according and star pictures according to such phrases that we've just heard? This brings us right back to the original knowledge, which is written in the Hebrew Scriptures. And so what we've got here is two books, one written on parchment and one written in the stars, telling the same amazing story of the battle between the serpent and the Messiah who's coming to save mankind. It's interesting it's on the ecliptic too because the star system where they believe that the major alignment will occur in 2012 is on Ophiuchus which is one of the star systems that's between Scorpio and I think is it Orion? Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, we talked about this in previous programs, can you please continue? Yes, Yes, we have. Uh, What I'm getting to this time is that, uh, firstly, the, the star groups are the same worldwide. For example, the virgin that was going to give birth to the Messiah. The Romans called her Virgo. The Hebrews called her Bethula. The Greeks called her Parthenos. And the Indians called her Kenya. But it's the same sign that we know as Virgo today. They all had the same meaning. No matter what their language, they all had the... The meaning never changed. They all had a common source. It wasn't, a, it, wasn't, it wasn't the word pagan, Virgo, Virgo. What it meant is a woman who had not had a previous pregnancy or previous yes, delivery. Yes, pagans, of course, hijacked all this later on. Right, they call it a virgin, meaning one is... Very, yeah. very clear. Yeah, exactly. Please continue. Now, the these uh, these star maps with these pictures are older than all the Christ legends that arose among the pagans later on. That, that was simply a counterfeit of an original knowledge, a divine revelation that was unchanged from, since our first man that came on earth. And it's a picture gallery of the coming Messiah and what he'll do to save us from this mess and end Satan's rule. Now, the interesting thing is this. One of these constellations was later on taken off, and this constellation we've been able to identify from an older star map found in Egypt, and uh, and uh, copied by Napoleon's troops when he arrived, and now in the Louvre in Paris, and uh, it shows the Virgin holding up a child, and he has a Hebrew name. That name is Yeshua. So here we've got it on the star maps. Here is Yeshua, the expected deliverer, on a sky map unchanged from earliest times, scientifically dated to the period 4000 BC. Wow. That takes us back to the time of Adam. Right. And this is when the promise was given that the virgin would, that the, the woman would conceive, the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's heel. In other words, he'd, he'd, he'd eventually destroy Satan. So there it is on the star maps, and his name, Yeshua, is there loud and clear, just as it is in the scriptures. What an amazing uh, witness again at the time of the end, because people need to understand. Once you start walking with God, once you understand and read these books and then read your Bible through different eyes, intellectual eyes, like the astronomer Alba Mazer, the Greek uh, Arab astronomer Alba Mazer, when you see these signs and figures actually 4,000 years B.C., then you start to realize that God knows the end from the beginning, and we are at the time of the end. Amazing discussion. We're going to continue again in a few weeks' time. Actually, no, next week. Next week we will continue. Next, next week, Tuesday, yeah. same time. Remarkable. Harry Schlanger back tomorrow. And Gary Creeper, our attorney.